Hi friends, it's been again. <clears throat> this is a video for Calc 4, Vector Calculus. We are looking at the idea of vector fields. <clears throat> and so uh, a lot of this we can take care of with just like an example or two. Um, <clears throat> the first thing that you're going to need to look at with vector fields is going to be the idea of drawing them. And so I want to show you an app that lets you do that sort of thing. <clears throat> but that app is not really all that hard to, to deal with. I said app, I'm wrong. It's a website, okay? Um, on, the, uh, on the jam boards where you're taking a look at stuff, uh, it, it will give you the URL for the one that I'm recommending. I'm sure there are other ones out there. This is just one that I know. And um, in particular, in particular, this one seems to be fairly low resource. Um, I know that math3d.org does something but it happens to uh, use the graphic processor on your machine. So it'll get really good pictures, but it'll heat up your machine and eat your batteries. So anyway, let me do the screen sharing bit and jump over here. This is called Calcplot 3D. And <clears throat> as you can hopefully see there, actually, I feel like I probably have shared this with most all of y'all before. Uh, as you can see there, you have some choices to make. And I'm going to tell it that I want to do a vector field. And it comes, comes with uh, something automatic on there. And if I want to put a new vector field in, I have to put this in. Then I have to, um, <clears throat> have to take off the picture there. Hopefully you can see the picture that we've got. I'm going to now twist it around a little bit so we can see because this had a two dimensional vector field. If you notice it's got an M and an N and a P there for your functions. And <clears throat> um, if you have something with the P equal to zero, that's going to be basically two dimensional, but it's being viewed in a three dimensional way. So. Um, if I click on restrict view to 2D, it will just zoom it in to such a way that you're looking right down the Z axis and you can't see that anymore. So as you can see with the picture there, uh, what it's done is to uh, take and sampled a bunch of X and Y coordinates and then drawn a vector uh, um, at those X and Y coordinates that is in the appropriate direction and stuff. So um, you can mess around with this a little bit. There is a rectangular, spherical, or cylindrical array sort of setting. Play with that at your leisure. Um, there's options down here where it has used fixed length for all vectors and if I do that, you can guess what's happening, but that's often useful if you just mainly need to see the directions that uh, your vector field is gonna make things flow in. Um, I, I kind of like using the constant primary color because if I don't, suddenly you've got this crap here with it being green and yellow and stuff that I can't really see. Uh, there's stuff about showing system DE's notation and flow line curve. Don't mess with those. Um, and there's a setting here where it says to scale vectors by dividing by and then gives a number. Obvious, uh, obviously, if you make that larger, then it's dividing things, you get smaller looking vectors. If you make it smaller, then the vectors are going to be pointing off there. But I would advise you 
to use some factor there where you're dividing out uh, so that it makes the uh, makes the vectors that it's illustrating look smaller just so you can see what's going on better. A uh, number of vectors there. I often crank that up to like 20 or so for my area that I'm looking at because I feel like I can then see what's going on better. But once you do that, it might be necessary that you do more division because, you know, it just might not fit. It might not get a picture that looks very good otherwise. Um, let me go ahead here and get something that has something with uh, with a Z in here and I am going to I'm not going to make anything super duper creative on that but I am if you'll notice it doesn't change things I changed a setting there and it made it not be 2d anymore but it didn't change the actual drawing until I uncheck it and recheck it. Okay. Uh, hey, it still didn't change anything, and that's because I had told it along the z-axis to only have one uh, set of choices there. So let me make that 20, and then you can see that that is completely un. Uh, supportable you can't really see what's going on for it so I will crank that down to 10 and then you can kind of see the directions of things that are probably we need to divide by less so that we can see it a little bit better okay it lets you see kind of some flow that's going on there but mainly with the graph stuff you're going to experiment around and see what you can show okay now <clears throat> the other big thing that we need to see for this assignment is some calculation stuff we are going to talk about a uh, differential operator and this is going to actually make some notation from the Calc 3 course a little bit easier. I think Don in particular probably went ahead and made use of this Dell operator in order to talk about the gradient uh, when we dealt with that. Uh, I didn't do that so much and it's just because philosophically I was trying to avoid talking about vectors. Uh, no, <laughs> I am not cutting on Don when I say this. It, I don't think his brain can conceive of not dealing with vectors because as a physicist, everything is a vector, you know? So, so uh, what we're going to look at real quick here is uh, thinking about this Dell operator. If you're dealing with a two-dimensional function, then you'll have a partial with respect to X and think of it as being multiplied by the I vector a partial with respect to y, and that goes together with the j vector. If it's three-dimensional, you add on the partial with respect to z and the k vector, okay? If it's not three-dimensional, then you don't have that. So uh, you could, in a sort of a philosophical way, uh, treat it as though you had that all the time. It's just that when you take derivative with respect to um, z and there's no z's automatically you get zero so but so that gives us a nice way to write the gradient of f and to think about it as just being distributed along with that operator and so you get the f sub x i f sub y j and then f sub z k so then we introduce something new called the uh, the divergence of a vector field, and that is when you have one of these vector fields that has a function uh, in the 
of, of x and y and maybe z in each of the x, y, and maybe z coordinates. And so just think about that as taking the gradient and dotting it with your vector field, okay? And if you're, if you say, I don't want to think of it that way, I want to memorize whatever it says in the textbook, have a field day, make sure you get it right. <clears throat> and uh, if it gets really difficult in the future, then uh, expect me to say, I told you so. So then this thing that we refer to as the curl, think about that as the gradient and a cross product with your vector field, all right? That'll be pretty messy to calculate, but you know it's just something that we calculate. If you would like um, an intuition as to what these give you, I am not your man. Um, I have looked at bunches of textbooks that always purport to give you some sort of intuition as to what the uh, divergence and curl actually tell you about a point or tell you about a vector field at a point. I have read them and then looked at the pictures and said, nope, don't see it. So my apologies. I uh, wish I could do better for you. All right. Here we're going to look at these three examples and just go bang, bang, bang on them. First one here is you've got a function f of x, y, and we're going to calculate the gradient of that function. So, of course, that's going to be f sub x times the i vector and then plus, come on, plus f sub y times the j vector. If you'd prefer to use the little um, uh, angle bracket notation, you can certainly use that as well. Uh, and so we need to think about x times e to the xy and take the derivative with respect to x. So of course you could have one e to the xy plus x times e to the xy, and then you pick up a y on that because you're taking the derivative of xy with respect to x. And then for the derivative with respect to y, the x is just a constant. So you have x e to the xy and times an x because of the chain rule. You'll tidy that up and have e to the xy plus xy e to the xy. If you would like, you could factor in e to the xy out of that. The other one would have x squared e to the xy, okay? And that's all there would be for calculating that gradient. Now, this one up here, we're going to think about the divergence of that f vector. And in doing that, I think I'm going to go ahead and just write gradient dot capital F. And that means that I'm going to have to think about the partial with respect to x of that sine of x plus y, and then plus the partial with respect to y of the zero vector, and then minus the partial with respect to z of that z e to the xy. And when you calculate that, uh, the derivative of a sine, of course, is a cosine of x plus y. Chain rule is going to give you that the derivative of x plus y with respect to x is just a 1. And then the 0 is just a 0. And minus the partial with respect to z of z is just a 1. And then the e to the xy hangs on there. If you want to simplify that a bit, you can simplify it a bit but um, we don't really, <laughs> don't really need to all that much there. So then with this last one here of taking the curl of the same thing there, you think about the gradient operator crossed with the f vector. And so we'll have to think about putting an i, j, k across the top a partial with respect to x, with respect to y, with respect to z across the bottom, or at the bottom, the middle, 
and then the sine of x plus y, the zero and the, oh my God, I made this too small. Sorry, I'm gonna take and resize that so that we can actually read it. Okay. And this may be just kind of a drawing mistake on my part. Um, just shove that out of the way. And what was it? Z e to the x y. And then grab, grab this and put it back where it was. All right. So then for the part where we have. Um, uh, the, the, I, the I portion of that, we are going to have to think about the partial with respect to Y of this Z e to the X, Y, and the partial with respect to Z of the zero. Well, the partial with respect to Y of Z e to the X, Y, you're going to end up picking up another X and Z and that e to the X, Y, and then we can leave that alone. Then we had to think about for the J coordinate, I have to do the partial, I'm sorry, I started that wrong, but do the partial with respect to Z of this sine of X plus Y, which will just be zero, and then minus the partial with respect to X of this Z e to the X, Y. So we'll end up with a minus Y, Z e to the X, Y, and then finally, we'll do the part that lies in the K coordinate, we'll do the partial with respect to X of just that zero, and then the partial with respect to Y of the sine of the X plus Y, but of course, we're subtracting it, so minus cosine of X plus Y. And then that's what, what we've got there, okay? Uh, not really much we can do to simplify it either, though. So keep those in mind. And then we will look at a little bit more with something we refer to as a potential function. Okay. So <clears throat> those gradients, uh, if you take the gradient of a function and then get a vector field out of that, then what you have done uh, um, in, in, well, what you have established as a relation there is the thing you took a gradient of in order to get that vector field is the potential function for the vector field, okay? So that's just our, our definition there, that if you can find a function that does that, it's the potential function. Then we have for functions or for, for vector fields with two variables, we have a simple way to establish whether something is, <clears throat> um, it has a potential function or not. You just take the X portion of it, take its derivative with respect to Y, and then take the Y portion of it, take its derivative with respect to X. If those are equal, then a potential function exists. And the way you find the potential function is just to integrate, okay? Um, I occasionally find people who find some sort of uh, methodology that they see in uh, YouTube videos or online or something about how they think they should find potential functions. And I'm going to say it's not, there's not anything magical about it. You just integrate with respect to the appropriate variables. And remember that the other variables are constants insofar as that variable is concerned. So here, for instance, we're asked to find a potential function for this f of x, y. And I want you to think about this portion here as being capital M and this portion here as being capital N. And we're going to check, I've already told you that we're going to find a potential function, 
but we're going to check and see does this fit the right thing where I should be able to find one. So you calculate m sub y. And so that means we have to come along here and take the derivative with respect to y. And so you'll have a 1 e to the xy and plus y e to the xy times x and then minus zero because the derivative of the sign will be that will be zero so this is really e to the xy times one plus y right and then if you check the other part we're getting n sub x and so we have to <clears throat> take that that derivative and get one e to the xy plus x Crap. I'm sorry, folks. I copied something wrong there and I have to fix it because otherwise it'll look like we did the wrong thing. Y'all see up here that I forgot to put my X together with my Y. Okay. Where was I? Uh, derivative of E to the XY with respect to X. So we'll have E to the XY and then the chain rule will make us pick up a Y. And then that cosine of y, when you do its derivative with respect to x, you just get a zero. So that means that we got e to the xy times one plus xy. And as you can see, these two things are equal. And that tells us we do in fact have something <clears throat> which is the technical word is conservative. And if it's conservative, we can find a potential function for it, All right? So <laughs> weirdly, my iPad is showing a, a different color on its screen than it's showing um, <clears throat> on, the, on the Zoom session. Okay, well, anyway, so now in order to figure out what that potential function is, what you have to realize is that uh, since um, since that m is going to be an f sub x, then that means that your f will come from integrating m with respect to x. But likewise, you can find it by integrating your n with respect to y. What I'm going to, going to advise you to do is to do both and then to fit them together, right? So we're going to come along here and say our f of xy is going to be equal to the integral. Let's see, m was y e to the xy minus sine x dx. And so uh, I will integrate there and I will get an e to the xy because I do a quick u substitution there. And then the integral of minus sine x is going to be a plus cosine x. And then we'll say plus g of y. You know how you have to put a plus c at the end of everything that you integrate? Well, you were integrating with respect to x, so y is our constants, so you should be good on that. Then you'll also say f of xy equals the integral, we write down the n part, x e to the xy plus cosine y dy. And when you integrate this, you'll get e to the xy. <clears throat> and the integral of a cosine, of course, is a sine. But then we'll have to say plus h of x. And notice the h of x will be that cosine of x. And the g of y will be the sine of y. So your f of xy is equal to e to the xy plus cosine x plus sine of y. And you can go ahead and put a plus c on the end. 
and then that will give you your potential function. By the way, if you're hearing noise in the background of the recording here, I have dogs who are snoring. So, sorry. Okay. But that is the potential function for that vector field. Okay. All right. So, let's look at another one of these. And this one is a three dimensional vector field. Okay. So, with a three dimensional vector field, the way that you check to see if something's conservative is by calculating the curl. If the curl is a zero vector, you know how uh, we were getting m sub y is equal to m sub x? Well, that's going to appear as just one of the entries in the curl. It would be, um, I think it's m sub, a, m sub y minus m sub x, or maybe it's the other way around. So, but <clears throat> with the curl, then we're getting all of the possible permutations coming out there. So, all right, let's go ahead and see about doing this. And we're talking about the gradient across our f vector. And so we'll have an i and a j, k across here, and a partial with respect to x respect to y, with respect to z, and this is messy to write, but 2xz e to the x squared, 0, and e to the x squared. Okay, so then writing the angle brackets here, for the i vector, the part that goes with it, we have the partial with respect to y of this e to the x squared, which is 0. And then minus the partial with respect to z of the 0. So we've got the 0 on that. And then for the j vector portion, we do the partial with respect to z here, minus the partial with respect to x here. So the partial with respect to z, you'll end up with just the 2x e to the x squared. And then the partial with respect to x, you put your subtract, you'll have an e to the x squared, and then times 2x. Those will cancel out and you'll get a zero as well. Then for the part that goes on the k, we do the partial with respect to x of zero, minus the partial with respect to y of the stuff that has no y's in it, and so we get a zero, and we do in fact have a zero vector, okay? So we have a conservative vector field. That means it does have a potential function. And to get the potential function, I will integrate 2xz e to the x squared dx. And of course, you would do a u substitution on that treating the z as a constant, it would just factor out to the front, and you'll have an e to the x squared plus g of y, z. So you can have any sort of combination of y's and z's that you can think of cropping up there. And we'll have to figure that out from the other pieces. Then we're gonna integrate zero dy and That'll just be zero, but it will also then have a function of x's and z's in any possible combination. And we'll have to look at them, look for them in the other pieces of, of integration. And then we'll have to integrate, um, integrate e to the x squared, which should intimidate you until you see that you're integrating it with respect to z. And so you've got z e to the x squared plus uh, gh. I want to use i, so I'll use j of xy. Okay. And then for our f of xyz, that's a potential function, you write down the common piece uh, that appeared in both of these. 
and which would be represented by the H in the second one. So we're going to write Z E to the X squared. And then uh, uh, for the rest of it, the G of X, Y, we would look for Y stuff here and Z stuff here, and we're not getting it. Uh, um, for the J of X, Y, we would look for X stuff there and Y stuff there, and we're not getting it. So we can just say plus C. And that gets us a potential function. Okay. If you're asking, why do I want this potential function? Well, uh, when we talk about vector field line integrals, and the fundamental theorem of uh, line integrals, that is going to play, that potential function is going to play the role of the indefinite integral. You will plug in points to it and you'll subtract and just have your answer from that. So anyway, I have not worked a bunch of examples here, but the examples I have worked have kind of gotten you uh, something to go on here. And the stuff that I haven't worked much of is drawing pictures with the computer. And you're going to go to a website and mostly experiment with some settings and figure out how to copy and paste. Okay. All right. I will see you all in class on Tuesday. And uh, take care.